welcome to Agronomic Alchemy. Today's topic is going to be one that I don't think anyone likes to really talk about. We had a discussion before this. It's, you know, we're facing lower commodity prices. A lot of input prices haven't really moved that much in 12 months. But in some cases, you know, we could be staring down 40% less profitability per acre due to commodity prices shifting. So let's relate it to agronomy and the question that, you know, we get quite frequently in a year like this, and we're looking to cut things out, can I cut out MPK? So, can we cut out NPK? You know, when we ask that question, that, and that's the question that everybody's asking is, because you look at you look at a crop and two of your major inputs is seed cost and fertility cost, James. And so where do, where's the, you know, seed cost, when we, when we talk about seed, we we've got these 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 hybrid companies. We've got these soybean companies out there. They're advertising. They're promoting their brands through yield responses they get. But then we go to talk about fertility, and nobody's out there promoting fertility and saying that you know with 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 this type of fertility you're going to get this yield response like they do with seed. But you know, so everybody says, well, hey, that's that's a great place to cut, and and that's where I see a lot of cuts that are getting ready to happen, and. And that really scares me because of, of the outcome that we could be facing. Well, the other side of that, too, is um, just over the past couple years, from um, just my consulting experience, looking at fertility costs, these guys that used to use, um, you know, urea, map, dap, that was their common go-to. Now they're looking at other sources because they're having to shop around for prices. So guys that may have never used litter, or it's been, you know, 10 to 15 years since they did, now they're going back to different sources of fertility. So where they may have had their farm finally pegged and worked out and being able to get the yields that they have been, you know, setting their goals and their sights on, now they've kind of had to go backwards and look at different forms of fertilizer and they're trying to they're trying to treat it the same as they have their past input and expect the same input. Um I'm sorry, not same input, same result, but it's coming from different sources. So like Rob said, you got your seed costs, you got your fertility costs, but what has changed in those fertility choices that they've got now that, I mean, that's thrown a wrench in the whole deal too. I, yeah, so, I mean, that's a really important question. And those fertility choices will bring in different placements that you may not have been using or not have been using in the past and different efficiencies around those fertilizers. I guess the main question is, is if you're looking at a soil test and how often do you get this question? You're somewhere and you're in Illinois and you look at your K values, your K values are through the roof. You might be down in an area that uses a lot of chicken manure or hog manure, and you're looking at P test levels that are 150 to 200 parts per million in the soil. In those instances, is it safe for growers to say, hey, we're gonna cut back on those inputs this year because my soil test is showing that it's available? You know, is that a safe option if you're looking to cut costs? Well, I don't... So... go ahead, Molly. Go ahead, Rob. Well, well, I was just going to say, Dr. Uh, Ronnie Helms, he taught me something this past week that I was not very aware of, and that was that soil tests are generally only 17% effective at reading what's going on. So you have 17% effectiveness of your soil reads, and then aside from that, I've preached before that what goes on in a lab is not very conducive to what is going on in your real infield instance. And so to me, a soil test is just a basic kind of guideline. It's just a little blip of what's going on in a small piece of your field. And so these guys may have pulled samples. You know, we've got common grid samples now. And then we've got kind of the more the old school samples. But still, it's just a very small fragment of what's going on in that soil at any point in time. And whether we pulled it in a low spot or high spot or maybe a field corner, you know, all that stuff's relative. But to me, even if we get a grid sample that has read across the field as a whole, that's still not, to me, a perfect guideline as to what to go on. So if I'm looking at a guy's soil and it shows that he has super high amounts of phosphorus, just for example, I have a grower here that he's a dairy farmer and he puts out mass amounts of dairy manure through the pivot. And so we pull samples on him and it shows that his phosphorus is just astronomically high. However, after we plant and we get emergence, within about two weeks into the crop season, we already have purpling leaves. Amazing. So that right there is a visual 
visual cue that we're lacking in phosphorus, even though our, his soils show that he has ample amount, it's not getting into the plant because it's not in a soluble plant usable source. And those but, soil samples are the ones that they're a guideline, but you've got to be able to know when to read between the lines and how to use those effectively. But Molly, how many times do we get faced every day during this time of year and the early seasons of the corn crop, you know, up to that, that V5, V6 growth stage, do you get that question? The same as I do. But, but, but my soil tests say, my soil tests say, if I've heard, if I had a, if I had a nickel for every time I've heard, and it's nothing against the farmers, it's the fact that just like we were told, you know, the phosphorus soil test, 17% accurate. That, just like Dr. Helm said, that that is an F. If we're in a classroom, that is an F. That's not even close to a D in any any school we go to. So I mean, it's it's we're we're messing with something here that's so inaccurate that it's just uh, boy, it's just hard. To, it's hard to cue in on sometimes. So when he mentions that seventeen percent, just to be clear, that's. That's a 17% accuracy in terms of predicting a yield response from a fertilizer application. So what he's trying to say there is that 50 pounds, if you apply 50 pounds an acre based upon this soil test level, this will get you this yield response. So 17% of the time that's been accurate. And the reason is, is there's a lot of chemical interactions in the soil. Like go up to Illinois, look at two to one clay structures with potassium and look at the issues they have. They have really high potassium soils. And as soon as the soils get dry, all that potassium gets trapped in there and they're really struggling to get it up into the plant. You know, mm. we talk about these things with P and K. The one thing no one's ever going to cut is nitrogen. I mean, realistically, growers are conditioned to using nitrogen. And, and previously, you know, up until about 20 years ago, if a, if a corn plant looked purple, they just throw more nitrogen at it. Now we're looking at different forms and fertility. P and K is the sensitive one because it's something we see accumulate in the soil. We don't see nitrogen accumulate in the soil. So everybody right now is being like, well, maybe we should cut back on P and K. And yeah, we don't sell fertilizer here. We're not talking about this, but we're talking about profitability on the farm. So my question to you is, if you've got a thousand acres and you farm a thousand acres of corn and commodity prices are down 40%, your earning potential off that thousand acres has dropped. Now you talk about, you can't pick up 40% more yield what you have to do is you have to focus on picking up your ROI or your profitability per acre. And one of the first things that we look to do is cut out P and K. Well, the risk in doing that, you know, we can't afford to go back 10 bushel this year. You don't know what's going to happen. Are you going to have a cool, wet spring? You know, we haven't talked about that. What happens if you have a cool, cool, wet spring and phosphorus is even less available? How much is that hurting your yield? And can you catch up, Molly? You used to, you work for a company that used to sell a lot of foliars, a lot of different products. If you're behind the eight ball on phosphorus early, can I foliar feed it late and catch up? So that's what I was going to say, especially about, you know, you were mentioning potassium and stuff. And, you know, we'll circle back around to this, but there's such a buzzword out there. Like you said, nitrogen has a stigma. Potassium has now become a stigma because I wish I had a dollar for every time I heard potassium acetate. And it's because potassium acetate is a quick band-aid on a visual deficiency. And so that's where it got its notoriety. They think that they can foliar feed these nutrients in later on after they see a problem. And once there's a problem, at that point, you're playing catch up. You're steadily losing yield. And instead of building it and, you know, setting your crop up to get the most it can get, you're constantly playing catch up. Phosphorus is not one of those things that we can play catch up with. It very, very rarely, almost never, are you ever going to see phosphorus move from the top down. So in a foliar sense, it's not a good idea to try to say, well, I'm going to cut back on my phosphorus early, and if I see a problem, I can probably feed it in, you know, a little bit later. Well, I mean, we know, even from our literature and things like that, at V10, think about how tall corn is at V10, right? At V10... The phosphorus uptake in corn goes to what percent? Like 70, 75 percent? Like 75 percent, yeah, you're right. So unless we try to have a hagee, you know, that's going to be able to go through that tall of corn, or unless we can possibly feed it through, you know, like a drip tape or, um, you know, like our tile, you know, like 
we've got some guys that have those capabilities. Where then does our application opportunity come in to try to fix that phosphorus later? I mean, you missed the boat. I'm sorry, but unless you can swim, you're screwed because the application opportunities are not common and they're not really there. And then on top of the fact, you have to look at the mode of action too. Phosphorus is very rarely going to move whatsoever from the top down. It needs to go from the soil and be absorbed through the root. That's just how it works. It's the nature of the beast. So these guys that choose up front to say, hey, let's cut back a little on our P and K inputs and we can kind of catch up later. Um, there is no catching up, guys. Like, we got to get yeah. it in in the opportunity that we know that it works in that mode of action or else you're left swimming. And I'm, I mean, I hate to be that way, but it's time that we tell guys the truth and stop sugarcoating things and hoping that there's a Band-Aid fix along the road for them because there's not. Man, there's a lot of valid points she just made there, James. And, and you know, I, I'll, I'll reiterate the fact that I've always said there's been many a times that I've gone before groups of people and, and I've made the comment. I said, if the good Lord intended on us to feed plants through the leaves, he had to put the leaves in the ground and to put the roots in the air. So, you know, that's that's just what it is. And 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 we can try this. And you know, one thing that I, I see in this industry today is I see so many products out there that try to replace, you know, they try to replace 100 pounds of fertilizer. And, you know, I think the one important thing for us to always remember, a unit of fertility is a unit of fertility. Can we be more efficient with that unit of fertility? Absolutely. Can we replace, can we be, you know, can we be 460 times more efficient when we take a pound of fertility and call it 100 pounds of fertility? Absolutely not possible, regardless of what we do. I think it's important for guys this year to not get caught up in, in looking at um, a lot of specialty products like that, that that bring those levels of, I don't know, what's the right word, Molly? What am I trying to think of here that that bring those levels of of insecurity out maybe? Maybe that's the right word? Well, I don't, I don't think it's insecurity. So what you're saying is uh, maybe that, like if you're replacing, if you're replacing fertility with another product to equal the same outcome, it's probably a higher risk this year than it is in the past. Yeah, so right. cut back and replace it with something else to try and gain something. I think this is the year from a fundamental perspective to be looking at NPK. And when we're looking at looking at more, if, I wouldn't say, you know, where and that's a that's a difficult question when you're talking about this with growers. So if I'm a grower right now and I've got two by two set up, am I using 10340? Am I using an 80-20 blend? Am I using a 50-50 blend of ortho poly? I think this is going to be the year where perhaps, you know, you need to be looking at you know, what is the best cost per unit for phosphorus. All of the phosphorus becomes inorganic phosphorus anyway in the soil or orthophosphate in the soil eventually, and it's subjected to all the same tie up. So maybe we just look at form, timing, and placement. And those are some ways that we can probably capture back and get some more efficiency. I mean, should we be looking at maybe, you know, more precise banded applications with liquids or, um, is this the year where two by two really stands out over a broadcast application? I don't know. These are these are this is a good time to to look at these things, but you know, farmers need to know what they're doing is going to give them a response. Well, you got to think too. One of the main variables that's probably not discussed very entirely is rented ground. How many farmers yeah. rent ground now versus own? And so, if I'm a farmer and I know that I'm only going to be able to rent this ground for the next two years. What kind of inputs do I want to put into the ground itself that's going to leave a residual for the next guy? So do I do a marriage of 60-40? Do I do 60% dry, 40% liquid at planting? Do I do, um, you know, a 50-50? As an agronomist, I'll never tell you to go all dry or go all liquid. I think each one has its place. To me, dry feeds the soil and leaves the residual bank to pull from, and liquid feeds the plant at the time the plant needs it. But these guys that, you know, they're renting this ground, these are things that they have to look at is, you know, what source of fertilizer are they going to put out? Because is it going to just carry them from year to year, or is it going to build up their fertility in their soil? And I think that's a big variable that these guys are looking at if they own their farm. I think that their fertility inputs are probably going to be slightly different 
in these guys that are just going year to year and not trying to build up and benefit the next guy, which I don't blame them. Well, they're trying and, to get the best they can get for that year and move on. And, and to that point, also, that's this is a year where I want to draw from the bank. You know, we've we've put all this fertility out there for years and years. We've worked really hard. I mean, you you like myself have really really re- worked hard to, to to help farmers creek strong fertility. You know, we've both been really avid in in grid sampling. And, and and helping farmers learn about how to to use soil sampling, and and to to keep their fertility where it needs to be, and and we've built these these savings accounts. I mean that's what they are. Fertility in your soil is a savings account. This is the year that I want to reach out there. I want to grab some of that, but in order to grab that, we're going to have to have help getting that back out because the the the, the elephant in the room, you know, fixation, it, it, it has occurred. And and why is that fertility still in the ground? It's because it's become tied up. It's time to untie that knot. Well, is it? Are we talking about? A, are we talking about a savings account, or we're we talking about Social Security that we pay into and we don't know if we're going to get in thirty years? Good point. I mean, great. Re- really, really, really. <laughs> every time we're doing this, we're putting something away for an end date that we don't know we're going to be able to access. I think the main point of this conversation, and I think you know, we probably created a lot more questions that we can talk about after this, but that if it boils back down to it, we're talking about NP and K. And is it okay to cut back? I think the two main things from this conversation is A, predictability from soil tests is low, fixation is high. You really have to understand your soils pretty well. And if you're a farmer that's done rate response trials in the past and you've noticed on your farm that you haven't seen a dip and you have multiple years of doing this, that's probably, you know, you know your soils you know that you might be able to cut back. But I think the risk is too great this year. Um, if you take bushels off the table, you're further limiting your earning potential across the farm. So I think out of this, wouldn't you agree, the main thing is is stick to your NPK. We can think about timing and placement. I think a great point to pick up for our next one is how you would manage that on rented ground. Yeah, yeah, definitely. Um, I know it sounds like it's a very daunting task to not be able to pull out of that MP and K and so not trying to scare anyone but if that's a concern of yours and you're trying to look at bettering yourself and your MPK input you know this is where you come in and you talk to people like your consultant like us and we can help you in making the MPK that you're putting down or you're already existing much more efficient for you it's not something to be scared of it's something to be discussed ask questions Get good, educated answers and let somebody help you. Don't be scared to, to ask for help because there's ways to boost your budget and boost your inputs and effectiveness of your fertilizer input. But a lot of the times, just like we said, those stool tests, 17% accuracy. So how do you know how to read that and get what you need to get? Like, I'm just saying, we sound like we were gloom and doom a little bit, but there's always an open phone line between myself, Rob, James, whomever is your trusted consultant, like ask those guys. Don't be scared to ask. Yeah, you're absolutely right. You know, this year is going to be all gas, no brakes. We've got to get every bushel we can this year to make this profitable. We've got to make every bushel count. We've got to add bushels, and we've got to figure out ways to add extra bushels beyond what we're used to making this year while conserving the funds that we put into this crop, not to overspend on this crop. Right. With that note, we'll wind up for this week, but let's talk on the next one. I, Molly, I really look forward to sitting down and, and you brought up a point here that I don't think we really talk about. How do we manage rented ground versus ground we own? So on the next episode, we'll dive into that a little deeper and see what we can uncover. <laughs>